Good morning and welcome to the Adventure Effect Live with Tom and Curtis. Today we have the very, very great pleasure to welcome Mike Harris onto the show. Uh, Mike is a coach, Mike is an adventurer, uh, he has an excellent beard and is generally just a fantastic human. Um, those of you who have read uh, what I have posted about uh, today's endeavours will know that I would love to be able to predict what we're going to talk about. But with Mike, you never quite know. Um, and when the three of us get together, it is always a raucous adventure. Uh, so I'm looking forward to discovering what we will discover over the course of the next hour. Mike, welcome to the Adventure Effect Live. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, and thank you, Curtis, for uh, for having me here today. And I'm uh, I'm excited to see what we get into. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Yeah, it's been it's been so long since I've seen you guys. Yeah, it's been like at least forty eight hours. <laughs> We've missed you. So we often start with this this question, and it feels like a good question to start with today. Um, what does adventure mean to you? What does adventure mean to me? Um, being open to whatever happens in the moment. Um, you know, like all the, all the circumstances, that is inconsequential. Whatever, whatever is happening in the moment, uh, adventure is, a, is the state of being that encompasses being open to that. Whatever it might be. Love it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the adventure of being Mike Harris? Uh, wow. what, what do you want people to know about you before we kind of get stuck in? What do I want people to know about me? Um, the, the adventure of being Mike Harris is, um, it's, you know, it's funny. It doesn't feel that adventurous. It doesn't feel that adventurous all the time. But I, uh, I, I do enjoy being in unpredictable situations. Um, I've... Uh, I guess for the last five years or so, I've been spending more and more of my time in the outdoors, uh, camping, doing long hikes, uh, doing some, uh, some semi-technical climbs and being, a, I guess, being in the majesty of nature as much as I can. And the reason for that is I feel like it saved my life when uh when i was rock bottoming uh five years ago i was in a career that felt like it was a dead, at a dead end um <clears throat> i was uh i was i was really unhappy with it i'd been traveling and working 80 90 hour weeks nonstop for god close to a decade at that point and it didn't feel like the the life that i had promised myself was happening and when I finally hit the wall, it, it didn't really have anywhere to go. Nothing was fulfilling. Nothing that was that had been exciting to me before was getting me there. And my wife, uh, being the the sage being that she is, asked me to go for a walk with her in the woods one day. We had these little these little short hiking trails, maybe maybe a mile long. Uh, across the street from our house and we took to those and before I knew it we were doing it every single day and from there um, the my appetite just increased for that so and what's funny is that it rekindled the sense of adventure that I'd had before I before I started sitting in front of a screen for a living you know the the adventures that I used to create for myself in, in my regular life, in my career. Um, I'd been a pro poker player before I worked in the corporate world. Um, I'd been a, uh, a national class pool player, was on a team that won uh, multiple amateur championships. And we'd, uh, and there was always, there was always some twist to life that was completely and utterly unpredictable, something that I could never be prepared for. And as it turns out, that feels like it's become the magic in, in coaching for me. Being, uh, being prepared 
to be unprepared for the unpredictable. One of the one of the cornerstones of, of what we do is this belief that magic happens in the unknown. That it's only when we are outside of our comfort zone, when we don't know what's going to happen, that magic can can creep into our lives. Because when we're in the same rut, doing the same thing, speaking to the same people, you know, driving the same car down the same road to the same office to drink coffee out of the same cup, there's no room for innovation or magic or spontaneity or or whatever. But when we're in a situation where we're like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know if I'm going to survive even. That's when um, new pathways are formed in the brain, new experiences can happen and, and suddenly innovation happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that, um, and that sense of comfort that you alluded to um, is also necessary for me. The same as discomfort is necessary for me. Uh, you know, outside of my, my home, I crave that discomfort inside my house like it messes me up if like if my wife moves an end table from one side of the chair in the living room to the other side of the chair like that will jack me up for weeks i i crave stability to that extent at home i like i like certain things at home to be to be static to be incredibly profoundly boring to provide a foundation to take bigger risks outside of that mm. So that's a fun place to talk. Let's let's dive into that a little bit more. How does that? Um, so just to to reflect back, you need that sense of of stability in your cave to enable you to venture out of the cave into big bad world and and take risks and experience the unknown. Well, it's um, yeah. Well. I, I learned that about myself as a, as a poker player, right? Um, I, you know, playing poker, doing any kind of gambling for a living, is is a game of of variance, right? You, you're gonna like you're gonna have swings to both sides, to the to the red and to the black, and that is um, no matter how well you're trained, <laughs> it's gonna get to you at some point because we will always we will ultimately out risk our training at some point in our life we always will if if we don't it's because we have never left the cave at all and in order to uh in order to help my nervous system uh restore itself coming home to the same cave and having not everything the same, but having some semblance of a, of a routine where I can say, I know that this is, I know that I'm coming home to this. I know that this is what my life will be once I walk in that door. There's, there's something profound and restorative about that. That is a, yeah, it's, it's a lever really. That's what how I would describe me it. As you, as you talk there is that, being being in a flow state is um, you know Stephen Kotler will say that being in a flow state is cognitively expensive, right? It's energetically expensive. And when we're in the unknown, when we're responding to our environment, whether that's at the poker table, whether it's on in the mountains, whether it's in a conversation with a client or you know whatever, we're in a we're in a peak state. We're like hyper focused. We're aware of everything that's going on around us and we're using up a lot of energy. And so if you then come back to your cave and you're, you, you know, you open up the drawer expecting to find cutlery and you find the dishcloths. The <laughs> <sighs> then you're back in the unknown and that relaxation, that recovery period that is so important after we push ourselves, suddenly you're not getting that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the little things matter a lot in recovery. Mm -hmm. yeah and and as we know very well rest day is training day yes mm. yeah every day is training day 
Every day is training day, including the rest day. Including the rest day. Yeah. So what's it like being a being a professional poker player? Um, there is uh, there's an awful lot to navigate that I think uh, I think it would be easy to overlook. Um, I got started because I was working as a bartender. Um, I was dead broke. I was working at this crappy cantina and we had ESPN on one of the TVs one night when poker was starting to get big on TV. And I, I had never watched it before. And I stopped and I watched these guys in there. They're betting hundreds of thousands of dollars and they looked like they were having a great time and they were talking trash and they were wearing sunglasses inside. I'm like, why are you wearing sunglasses inside? And it looked like it was just such an intriguing thing. And by the time I'd watched for 15 minutes, I was like, I'm going to do this for a living. Like this, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing as, as a pool player. I mean, that's uh, gambling is, is embedded in the pool lifestyle although it's, it's a little less structured and, uh, and a little less certain outcome wise, but, um, but being a pro poker player, it's, I mean, I started playing online. The great thing about it is that you're only in your own energy. If that's what you want to be, you can, you can sit there in front of a computer and look at cards and, you know, other players are playing the cards you can look at your cards and calculate odds and be in your own environment and learn the game and play the game and, and navigate the, the ups and downs that way. Um, the other things that come into play are how you talk to yourself, how you talk to yourself after you win, how you talk to yourself after you lose, how you talk to yourself when you've done both of those things six times in a single session. Um, those are, uh, those are things that I, uh, I had to learn to source for myself very, very quickly because my style of play tended to lend itself to pretty big swings and having lost, you know, early in my career, having lost and won a few thousand dollars several times in a single day, and prior to that, not even having a hundred dollars in my bank account, it was mind blowing to me. And I didn't know how to reconcile that for myself. So learning how to have these conversations with myself and come back to neutrality, the cards and the results and the money and everything that everybody says in the chat online and everything that everybody says to you in person, none of that matters. Mm. It's just information. Mm. And just like, just like reading the news, some of the information is relevant. Some of it, you're like, that was not useful at all. And some of it, you're like, I wish I never saw that. And I'm going to do my damnedest to forget it. So one of the things about adventure, about, you know, stepping into the unknown is, is what we learn about ourselves and who we become, you know, who, who are we before the adventure and who are we after and so you talked about like you never had a hundred dollars in your bank account and then suddenly you were like thousand dollars two thousand dollars up down um you mentioned about like the self-talk and and all of that what did you what did you take from that experience into the rest of your life as a professional um well, I think the big lesson from that is I, I created a I created a, a major rule for myself, and that is I don't determine whether something is is noise or signal until after I've had the chance to slow down and sit. So whether that's uh, a result at the poker table, whether that's feedback I receive at a, at a corporate job, um, whether that is the, um, something that came out of a, a client session or a session with my coach. 
in the moment, I can, I mean, I can name it noise or signal. I can make some meaning out of it, but I won't really know what it is until I've had the chance to be with it a little bit, let it settle in. Right. It's sort of like, um, like, you know, if, if you're out, if you're, you know, say you're taking your, your skis up a mountain, right. You're taking your skis up a mountain for the first time and, and you have a pain that you've never noticed before. You can stop and make some meaning out of the pain, or you can keep going and let the pain settle in and see what it turns out to be in a few minutes after you've let the sensation settle in your body and you're not telling stories about it. Yeah, because it could be that you've broken your knee and you need to stop. Or yeah. it could be that your, you know, your gait pattern is just off a little bit and the pain is just a signal that you need to slide your skis instead of picking them up. That was a lesson I learned this weekend. Um, and yeah, so what you're talking about there is respond versus react. And, and I take it a step further and, and respond slowly. Mm. Yeah, increase the distance between, um, between stimulation and activation. Yeah. Funny, I would never have thought that that would be a lesson that would come from poker. <laughs> you know, I know people who say they never make the, the same mistake twice. It's not me. <laughs> I, I, will, I will make the same mistake two times in a row just to check. Well, there's yeah. a good chance that these people who say they never make the same mistake twice I'm mm -hmm. just not aware of the first iteration of mistakes that they made before they caught the mistake that they made. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. I used to, I mean, there's, say, there's a lot of hindsight bias in all of this that we, you know, we. <laughs> yeah, totally. I used to have a saying, um, try anything twice. Yeah. It's, amounts to the same thing that you were saying there, Mike. Like everyone says they'll try something once, but the first time I try something, it might be a disaster, but it might be for reasons that have nothing to do with the fact that I don't enjoy it or it's not good for me, or I'm not gonna learn something. It could be entirely mm -hmm. circumstantial. So, you know, whether it's like a new dish in a restaurant, maybe it was just the second chef and not the main chef. Or maybe I was just in a bad mood and that impacted my taste buds. Right. Or if I'm going to go and try a new sport, you know, out in the wild, like maybe I just wasn't fit enough and I need to try it again. Or you never know what you're carrying in that you don't know. And so try anything twice for me. It's like, well, you need more data before you make a decision. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if I didn't, I mean, if I didn't try everything twice, I would give up on a lot of things after the first try. <laughs> you know, I mean, like you, like you uh, made mention in uh, on one of your previous Facebook posts about me, uh, about me being a runner, and I wouldn't still be running if I didn't try it twice. Because the first time I tried trail running, I you know, the the woods near my my house. It's a, a an oddly an oddly technical trail, lots of roots and rocks, and like a hundred, you know, like a hundred feet in the first, uh, the first time I ran, I tripped over a root and, and fell flat on my face. And when, like, when I fall, like, I'm like, I'm not graceful. I am a jerk. I am a little brat when I'm like, I'm so mad and my pride is so hurt <laughs> and I make the biggest scene about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, this is all very prescient for, for us as coaches, right? Because one of the things that, that we do with clients is we, we open up possibility for them of something being different. And when we do something different, it sucks, right? It's scary. It hurts. Your whole world is shaped around going, you know, over this way. And now suddenly you want to go over this way. And the world is like, no, 
no, I don't know what, I don't know what's over there. I know what's over there. And so, you know, our job as coaches with our clients is to support them in doing it twice and three times and four times. Yeah. Possibility always includes the thing that we want to avoid or argue with. Almost always. Hmm. Right. We want to, we want to argue with what the outcome was, with what we think we're able to do with, you know, there's, there's that one thing that we don't want to do. We get out of bed in the morning that we know will make our life 10 times better, but we just don't want to do it. I get that with my movement specialist. I'm working with somebody to realign my kinetic chain. And she always says to me, do you want to try this now? And I'm like, no. And then I stop myself and I'm like, wait, she's only asking me if I want to try this thing because she sees that I'm ready. And so I'm like, you know, over time, I've learned to trust her judgment. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want to try that thing. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, mm, no, but let's do it. And it always works out for the best. I mean, for the best, I'm in her, I'm in her treatment room throwing a tantrum about how my body can't do the thing that she asked me to. But a little further down the line, I'm like, that was a really good idea. This feels amazing. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's how it goes, isn't it? The, yeah. the, you know, the, the thing that we resist the most, I mean, think, just think about letting the, you know, going back to letting the, the pain settle in a little bit. Yeah. Right. I, like, I used to never let the pain settle in. That was, that was, uh, that was exactly the thing that got me everywhere I had been. Right. It had gotten me into, you know, into a career I didn't want. It had gotten me um, at some point during that career, I weighed well over 300 pounds. Um, like I looked like I was regular Mike Harris who had eaten another Mike Harris. Um, I had a, and all like all these parts of my life had just, I, I never would let the pain settle in. I would never let the discomfort settle in. And if you don't let it settle in, how do you know if it's real? Well, and if you don't let it settle in, how do you know that your reaction, which is what it is at that point, it's not a response. How do you know that your reaction is appropriate? Right. Because if you're just like, oh, there's pain, I'm gonna run away then you you're just like oh fuck now i'm over here i didn't want to be i didn't want to be here but there's the pain is over there so uh, this must be better right see and that's and that's the thing it's that you we you've got a story behind the pain right the story behind the pain is it's going to keep happening and it's going to get worse and it's going to suck and then my life is going to suck i mean we could go on and on and make this a complete tragedy but you get the idea that this is like this isn't going to stop that I can't go through this or even better. I don't deserve this. And, and I'm better off if I avoid this. Yeah. Which, which plays out for so many people in what they tolerate in their lives. Right. They yeah. tolerate the shitty job. They tolerate the shitty boss. They tolerate the shitty relationship. They tolerate the, you know, whatever it is, because actually dealing with it, there is a little bit of pain. You know, you have to drag those skis up the hill. But the thing is, once you get to the top of the hill, the view is so much better. Yeah, and they tolerate it for themselves too. Mm. They tolerate it for themselves too. Right. And like, I mean, where, wherever you see the world uh, missing integrity, mm. you can bet that the moment you walk in front of a mirror, you will see that right there. Yeah. I have a, I have a meme that I'm waiting to write a post about, um, which I think is going to be quite fun, but it's a little, a little stick figure with another stick figure that is about to kind of club him over the head with a stick. And the stick figure is labeled me. The other stick figure is labeled me. 
and the stick is labelled me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just so true. We'd like, we spend so much of our time beating ourselves around the head with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's accurate. That, that is quite accurate. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to writing that post. I don't know what's going to be in it, but yeah. I saw the meme. I was like, okay, something's getting written about that. <laughs> so what happens when we stop tolerating um well when we stop tolerating there is room for possibility to enter there's room for us to create something right because we're not dealing with anymore we're not dealing with our own bullshit we're not dealing with anyone else's uh crappy behavior we're we're not dealing with any of that stuff we're not dealing with the circumstantial mm. right not tolerating is like a, it's like a precursor to to uh, generation to gen to generative creation that's that's what that's what happens when we stop tolerating we um and and the thing is is that there's a trap in that too because we can like you just alluded to, we cannot tolerate and still be beating ourselves up with ourselves. Mm. That there's, there is that trap, but when we get into action, when we start, when, when we start doing something productive, moving forward, we can really start generating uh, something much closer to our potential. Yeah, because tolerating takes up so much energy. Yeah. So I mean, just think time. about, I mean, just think about any time in your life you've ever really wished that you were somewhere else, right? Like where you've ever really wanted to, you know, you're in a conversation with someone and you're like, I would rather be anywhere other than talking to this person right now. And how much energy that drains you of, that, be, that being your, I mean, you're imagining all the reasons why this isn't good for you. You're imagining all the places you could be instead of this. You're, you're creating some really wild dreams and in the process of draining yourself of energy. And how much worse does that make your experience of that conversation with that person? Exactly. It's, it I mean, it's, it's self-fueling. Yeah. And it could have been a perfectly great conversation if you hadn't brought that story in with you that this you know mike's an asshole and i don't want to talk to mike right right or it could have or it could have just come to a it could have come to a quick and graceful end when when the conversation felt like it was complete for you yeah yeah but instead we become you know we, we become the chef adding all the extra ingredients to the soup and next, and next thing you know, you've, I mean, you've emptied out the spice cabin mm -hmm. and the soup, it tastes terrible. So bad. Horrifying. The worst soup ever. So salty. So salty. And like, why did you put like cumin and paprika and basil and, and thyme all in the same dish? Why? Yeah. Now I'm thinking about soup. Uh, it is, it is, you know, it's, I don't know what the weather is like for you guys, but here it's very cold today. Today is a soup day. It's pretty soupy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just as, as, as you were talking about the, the conversation and throwing the ingredients in the soup and catastrophizing and like making the whole experience worse for yourself and for everyone else involved than it needs to be. I was thinking about, um, I'm doing this ocean challenge at the minute where I get in the, get in the sea every day. And, and, and noticing that separation between reaction and response or between stimulus and response is, it changes the whole experience. The, the first couple of times you, you get into the sea and it's cold and it hurts and your body screams and your brain is like, what the actual F are you doing? Get the hell out right now. And, and then 
after a few moments, like about a minute or so, that, that screaming pain, that like stinging pain goes away. And then they're like, oh, okay. Hmm. That's not so bad. And then you get the first wave of like real cold. And you're like, oh, okay, now this, now I'm, now I'm, this is bad. But you cannot tolerate that story and just be and relax into it. And then you, and then you get to this really serene and calming experience. And it's, it's so easy to not get there by reacting to the pain at the beginning, which is what we were talking about before. You feel the pain and you're like, shit, this is not gonna get any better, I'm out. And then you never get to the calm experience. You never get to the peace. You never get to the yes. serenity. And I, th I feel like it's a, it's a metaphor for so many things in life because it's, the, it's not the thing itself that is scary or difficult or uncomfortable or whatever. It's the transition from where you are to where you're going. It's the change of, you know, it's the, the movement away from homeostasis is what sends the body into panic. Yeah. And if you can just be with that, wherever you are in a work conversation, in a relationship, whatever it is, if you can just be with that discomfort, it will pass. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, in the in the context of say difficult emotions like really allowing yourself to not just be with them but to um to invite them in to be a part of um i i call it be a part of the room but really what it is say um you know say we're having a conversation and i'm having some some serious, uh, some serious feelings of grief. Um, the instinct is to not invite them in, right? To let them, to make their presence known maybe, but sweep them under the rug or minimize them, uh, deny their existence, lie about them, whatever. But instead, I use the cue, what needs to be known about it? Like if it were another person in the room, how would it introduce itself? What would it, what would it really want us to know about it? Mm -hmm. And let it be a party to whatever interaction is happening. So we can give it the same reverence that we would give one another. And see what that does for it. So often we, you know, the, these emotions we experience, they, they suffer from a lack of attention, lack of being seen, heard, known. What happens when we, when we nourish them in that way? Yeah, I love that. I've not, you know, I'm familiar with, with the concept, but I've not heard it articulated exactly that way. I think that's it's such a beautiful thing to acknowledge the feeling as an, as an entire person or as an, an entire entity of itself and what's the message and what is this thing trying to tell you about your current reality? Yeah. Yeah, because even even though it is it is not separate from anything, um, letting it be fully expressed as if it were, um, it it gives it power in a positive way, right? It gives it it gives it the power to begin to to um, to heal itself because it's not something we have to we have to fight against or do something about, right? You know, like how we, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll talk about um, positive and negative thoughts, mm -hmm. right? And so if, if we're looking to have positive thoughts, then negative thoughts, when they happen, they become a thing. You're like, oh, no, whoa, 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 can't have that one. Nope, nope, you got to go out of here. 
this and is a positive party. Right. This is. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Once and once that happens, that you know, it's 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 like telling a like a little kid they can't like they can't reach for something in the cabinet. Like they're gonna go back to the cabinet every single time you turn around. Yeah, and this whole idea that it's positive and or negative yeah. is entirely constructive. It's a, just a signal. Yeah. It's 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 merely an interpretation. Yeah, you know, like, just what you're talking about is really removing the charge for, around feeling either a positive thing or a negative thing. I was having a conversation about this with a friend on the weekend, and I haven't stopped thinking about it all weekend. Where we have we have these charges where we're reacting emotionally to our emotional reactions, and to live in that reactivity is exhausting. And the whole idea of the law of attraction in the community where like we want to feel positive all the time, it's, it's not, that's not actually the goal. The goal is when we're experiencing something that's uncomfortable, something that hurts, the goal is actually to just be with that thing and understand that it's part of a process of getting to somewhere else and that that like this thing that feels uncomfortable right now that hurts for whatever reason to trust like oh you know what i've i've gone through things that have been really disastrous before and good things have come out of them and so i'm trusting right now and that's that's actually where the positive piece is where everything you always want to be in the most positive place you can be. It's not that like you want to move away from things that are uncomfortable. It's that you want to celebrate things that are uncomfortable when they're happening. It's it's a uh, it's taking me a long time to appreciate the wisdom of that, and I still am not in a place quite where I understand the execution of it. Well, this is this is the the metaphor that we use, Curtis, of the phoenix. And you know, we talk about how you know everything is burning to the ground, and it's a disaster, and we've lost our house, and you know everyone's dying, and you know it's, it's just a, a mess. But then, out of the ashes, at some point, the phoenix will rise, and the the trick, the hack, if you like, is to be in the fire and in that moment, anticipate the Phoenix. In that moment to know that something, we don't know what it is yet, but it feels like everything is collapsing and the world is ending. But something bigger and stronger and more beautiful and more eloquent and with more impact and whatever it is will rise. And that image is exactly what was in my mind while I was and, and it's one thing to come up with this beautiful image and share it with clients and be really excited about it. It's another thing entirely to apply it to our daily lives. And, and that, is, that is the thing that I am learning right now is how do, I, how do I apply this to my daily life and, and shift from it being something that I know something that I am where it's just who I am and that is a journey that's a big practice man it's a lifetime's work yeah it is a lifetime's work yeah that's yeah that's that's not a practice you ever give up it's not a practice you ever get to you ever get to rest on well I, I actually I did that last week so I'm ready for I'm ready for the next challenge. You ready for the next one? Yeah. I love that. I love <laughs> don't, don't you love when, when you have that you have like this foundational practice and you get it you get it perfect one day, you're like, all right, what's next? 
what's the, what's the next step? I'm, I'm ready for the advanced stuff now. Guess what? The advanced stuff is doing the foundational stuff again. And then again, and then again. Mm -hmm. And really is, it's that thing that you were saying earlier, Mike, about needing to leave the cave. If that system hasn't broken down at some point, if you've got mastery over it, and you're like, okay, what's next? Well, that just means that you have enough your game. You built a cave and you've stayed in that cave. Um, yeah. Right. It's rock climbing, for example. It's the same muscles, the same movements. Well, arguably, when you're climbing at certain levels, there's new movements you have to acquire. But within that range, it's the same game. And if you get the feeling like you're like, okay, what's next? It just means you haven't taken the next step. So if you've taken the next step, you're not asking that question of what next, what's next. You're back to like, oh, fuck me. How do I do what I did? Like, I had so much grace and beauty and flow in my climbing, and now I'm just a wretched disaster hanging on the end of my rope and crying, squealing like a girl, right? Like these things happen when we when we take that next step, when we're when we're going what's next, that's an invitation to explore deeper. It's like we're not asking what's next, we're asking how the hell am I gonna survive this? I don't know about you guys. I feel like how the hell am I going to survive this is a great place to be. It really does force us to draw on resources that we didn't know we had. Yeah, in a, in a way, it's a it's it's a simplifying factor, right? Like I've I've been. Um, I've been putting together some some writings about um, about the process of of mastery, and really, what I mean, the essence of it is that it's finding uh, it's finding the essential and the simple within the complex, and you don't get to go to that without being in a situation that's complex. Elaborate on that a little bit. Finding, well, the, re repeat that again, finding the what in the what? Finding the essential and the simple in complexity. Can you, can you go a bit deeper into that? Yeah, yeah. Any, anything you, you undertake, whether it is, um, you know, whether it's a skill or, or you know, finding something in your being, it goes through three stages. Um, the first is is simple which is practice it's um fundamentals acclimation getting used to the environment of doing or being whatever it is that you are working to do or be and then there is the complex where you go into fear you want to understand it um so say in um as this would play out, say using poker as an example, at first it's just learning how to play the game, learning the rules, um, getting used to playing a card game with other players and learning the basics of what of what a uh, proper play looks like. Then there's then comes the nuance of learning all the math, the theory, um, learning economic game theory, um, learning. Uh, what certain facial expressions and tells may or may not mean. Mm. Excuse me. Um, and other like other things like that, like details, nuances, and uh, and deeper theory. The simplicity happens when you can take all that and strip it down to its most essential where you're cutting all the noise out because a lot of the time the de the details, the complexities are both essential and 
in the moment they're noise. Right? If you're in the in the heat of the moment, the details become noise. Does that make sense? I, I, I would like to elaborate on that further, but I just want to make sure I'm not going too esoteric. I, th I think that makes sense. Yeah. You... All right. If you if if you think it makes sense, I might need to make it a little more real. <laughs> let me well, let, let me try and and see whether I, whether I've got it. So, when you first take on a thing, you just learn the basics, the fundamentals, the rules of the game, and then to go into a level of mastery, you have to learn the complexities of it, the nuances, the, the, the body language, the, the you know, whatever, it, the subtleties, the 1% the shifts that mm -hmm. take it to the next level. And when you're trying to put together, when you're in the, in the moment, in the, in the game, so to speak, in the cauldron, all those details until you've got them dialed they're just noise that prevent you from actually making progress. Right. At a, at a certain level, they, they, they get in the way. Mm. At a certain level, they get in the way. So I think, did, did I get it? <laughs> yeah, you did. Okay, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may continue. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, when, and and there's there's the part of it that's the that is repetition, right? That's you know doing something or being a certain way until you don't know how to not do or be that way, right? It's not it's not the idea that you can do it on command. And it's not that it's perfect. It's that I mean, you failure is possible, unlikely and oftentimes an anomaly it's one so of those things where you don't anomaly. you don't have a sense of like you have the sense of how to correct it but there are no technical details behind it like the way i've always described it is say like doing something physically right like uh we'll take something super simple curtis you you were a carpenter so um so so making a simple 90 degree cut i would i would presume that you've you've done enough, enough of those in your life to have mastered it. And if you screwed one up very mildly, you would A, catch it, and B, know how to correct it without having to, to analyze it, go into the details. You would, you would sense it right away. Is another part of that, like, um, a, a classic example of, of um, you know, of the, the thinking, doing, being progression um, is driving a car and learning to use a, a manual gearbox, a stick shift. Mm -hmm. And like when you first get in the car and you try and change from first gear to second gear, the car stalls, it's like juddering around, go, 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 and the whole thing's a disaster. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I cannot do that if I try. Right, because I have become a I've become a, a manual gearbox driver, and so my right. body, even if I try and force it to to fuck it up that way, it can't. I can't do it because those details are so assimilated into my being, and occasionally I lose concentration, and it will happen. But when I'm actually present to the activity that I'm doing, that is an impossibility. Right. Because my sensitivity in my feet, in my clutch control, in the timing of when I move the gear lever, you know, the speed that I do it at, all of those things are so kind of, all of those nuances, all of those details have ceased to become noise. Whereas at the beginning, you're concentrating on every single one of those all at the same time. So you can't do any of them correctly. Right. Right. And you hit the nail on the head when you said when you're present. Right when you are present, you you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Right that that level of attunement to what you're doing is is essential to to mastering anything. Are you familiar, Mike, with the journey from 
unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that what you're speaking to, if I'm understanding it correctly, maps really well into the journey from um, conscious incompetence, where you realize that you don't actually know what you're doing, to becoming consciously competent, where, like Tom said, you're holding all of the details in your mind and you're not yet, you haven't quite put them all together. And then all of a sudden you like kind of got something and someone throws in a new detail or refinement and the whole thing kind of falls apart and you have to rebuild it. And once you get to that point where someone can throw in a new detail and you're like, oh yeah, I got this, I got this. And the thing stops falling apart when you refine it. I think that's when you begin to pull simplicity out of the complexity. Yes. And a step further in that is when you're able to integrate some new information without the whole construct falling apart. That's one stage of simplicity. And we reach another stage of simplicity when we're able to communicate that information in a way that's easy for others to integrate without their kind of construct falling yeah yeah being being able to to teach what you are, what you know at that level is certainly its own level of mastery and what you spoke to before that being able to to draw in other concepts like that i i'm glad you brought that up because uh i've always been fascinated by elevating a discipline by translating another one into it you know taking you know, taking um, principles from from poker and gambling, and bringing them into into business and into coaching, and and vice versa. Uh, without everything falling apart, because uh, hang on, there the thoughts are the thoughts are melding really quickly. Yeah, like being able to do that. With, without everything falling apart that's um, well that's what we that's what we um, spend a lot of our time calling creative creativity and innovation right that's 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 the essence of it um, that we can take something that makes sense in another craft or another practice and find the parallel to what we're doing and maybe you know, if, if the fit is right, it enhances it. Google, Google is a big fan of this. Apparently they have, they have days marked off where their teams can just go collaborate with anybody they want on whatever they want. And, and they're not, forcing people to stay in their lane and the projects that come out of that are sometimes quite, quite innovative and because it's just that it's just that thing that you said that when we take when we take two or three things and we allow there to be a convergence of ideas or practices or disciplines that's when that's when we get innovation that's when we get magic it's, it's even more, Curtis, it's, it's everything that we know Google for came out of those, that one day a week where Bob can go off and do his own project. Google Maps, Gmail, everything. The whole, apart from like the search engine, which is like the basic function, all of these features that we now rely on came from someone going, huh, I wonder if I can make a map that people can use on their mobile phones. Um, which, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many different directions that that could take the conversation, but I love that they just, they created a space for something to happen and explosions of innovation. Yeah, and, and prior, to, prior to Google, the company 3M did that. And that was how we ended up with Post-it notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, they, they, had, they had some crappy glue that they couldn't use for anything and and through, uh, through departments collaborating and people having conversations about what they were doing, that's what they came up with was that, was these, uh, yeah, 
these little guys right here. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember once being taught that I had been doing post-it notes wrong my entire life. And I was shown a way to remove the post-it note from the pad in such a way that it would actually stick and not like, you know, how they like curl up around the edges. Mm. I was shown that. Uh, and then to go back to what we were saying at the beginning of this conversation, I never did it twice. <laughs> and 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 now it's gone away from from my experience of this life. Oh. And back to peeling sticky notes. <laughs> it's one of life's great tragedies. Indeed. Indeed. Well, now there's hope for all of our listeners who struggle with their post it notes that perhaps somewhere some sage person, not Tom Lang Lancaster, is going to come along and show them. Not Tom Lancaster. Tom Lancaster is nothing shy of a Muppet. In that well, In the post-it note removal department. You know, I, I get the sense that one of today's most searched Google terms will be how to peel a post-it note. Right. I, mean, I can I can hear the Google servers exploding as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we would have a high quality problem if that were the impact of our podcast. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> let me let me tell you something. We would we would have high quality problems in the world if that were the top search if that were the top search term on Google. Right. <laughs> yeah, we would not be worried about some of the things that we are currently worried about. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> most prescient subject was how to peel a sticky note properly. You may have just shifted into a quantum realm. It's possible. Where, where this simple thing that you've neglected to retain is actually the key to solving all of your ills. Well, I mean, I think that's a conversation for another time. That is not a conversation that we can squeeze into the next three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'll, um, that'll, that'll, have to, that'll have to be a happy hour conversation, guys. Yeah. So seeing as we are approaching, um, approaching time, um, which is always a shame with you, Mike, it's such a pleasure talking to you. Um, I, I would like to invite you if you have anything bursting forth from that giant brain of yours that you want to share before we wrap this conversation up. Wow, anything bursting forth from this giant this brain of mine. Wow. That's, <laughs> it feels like a lot of pressure. Um, but um, if, if I could, if I could have anyone take one thing away from, from this, uh, from this conversation, it would be this, that, um, getting better at, at doing or being anything and moving toward mastery at it is always moving toward simplicity. So if, if you feel called to, uh, if, if you feel called to add something in order to get better, think twice about it and look at what you can subtract first. Because the value, the value of, of your presence and your attention is going to far outweigh anything that any inputs that you can you can take in. I love that. As as you say that, I I mean the the gear stick metaphor jumps into mind. But also, I used to be a, a fire spinner. Well, I, I, I suppose technically, I still am. I used to do stilt walking and fire spinning with poi. And I love the journey of teaching someone to do the moves because when they first understand it, they're, they're using their shoulders and their arms and their hips and like everything to do, to do the movements, just to simply to avoid smacking themselves in the head <laughs> with these flying objects. And as they practice, as they practice, as they practice, it goes down. And so for me now I can do the same movement 
literally using just my fingertips because I've, I've been able to get to that place where I can remove all of the unnecessary movements that actually make it more complicated and, and more complex than it needs to be. Yeah. Mm. I love that. What can you remove in order to get better? It's beautiful. Thank you. And well, thank you for the prompt. It's my pleasure. Apologies for piling, piling the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the end of the hour. Um, Mike Harris, you are a beautiful human. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This has been um, a glorious adventure uh, into the psyche. Um, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please do hit the like and the subscribe and the share and leave comments and tell us what you think. Uh, we love to hear from you guys and we will see you next week on the Adventure Effect Live. Guys, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs>